Yeah, I think we can start. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our uh, microwave seminar. So today our speaker, our guest from University of Exeter in UK, Dr. Alex Powell, who will be talking about 3D microwave metamaterials uh, via enhanced manufacturing approaches. Alex, please, you can start. All right. Thanks for the introduction, Dimitri. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Alex Powell. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about uh, 3D metamaterials for electromagnetism and microarrays specifically, and how we go about making them. Um, the sort of structure of the presentation is going to be looking at um, my, my background, the background of some of this work, and the place I'm based at, which is the University of Exeter. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about 3D metamaterials for different kind of fields, uh, and then I'm going to talk about ways to make them and some of the approaches and some of the challenges that we still face. And um, after that, I'll talk about uh, two of my own investigations based on 3D interlaced meshes and um, 3D mi metallic microwave scatterers. And then I'll round off at the end and have some questions. Um, so I am a research fellow with the Royal Academy of Engineering. I'm based at the University of Exeter in the UK, which is the home for the um, Centre for Metamaterial Research and Innovation. So it's a centre that has about 50 staff and about the same number of um, PhD students. It's expertise in optics, microwave, mechanical, acoustics, thermal, kind of the whole gamut of metamaterials. We do a lot of fundamental research, but also work a lot with industry partners. I'm quite interested personally in industry facing research, um, but we have some people that are just hardcore theorists or fundamental scientists as well. Um, and we've recently become the lead of the um, UK Metamaterials Network, which is a big kind of bringing together of um, academic institutions and industrial partners trying to translate metamaterials research into um, industrial impact. And Professor Alastair Hippins is the, the leader of that based at Exeter also. So that's kind of where I'm located. Um, and I'm now going to go on to talk about some of the 3D metamaterial kind of uh, background. So firstly, I'm not quite sure how well versed everyone in this chat is in metamaterials. So I'm gonna give a quick introduction to kind of what they are. Um, basically they're materials, artificial materials that we engineered have properties that may not be found in natural bulk materials, or at least to give some kind of advantage in like weight or strength or um, cost. Basically, um, natural materials, the properties they have are defined by the atoms that make them and the arrangement of those atoms. In metamaterials, we can make meta atoms, which are the building blocks of this material. And by deciding the properties of the meta atom and how it's arranged, we can make a whole series of all kinds of new properties for um, these artificial metamaterials. And yeah, there's huge amounts of work going into this. So in terms of 3D materials, um, in, from a theoretical perspective, metamaterials have always been considered um, in three dimensions, but from a, a practical standpoint, actually in a lot of fields, 3D materials are quite hard to fabricate. And so a lot of the work has kind of been focused on 2D or stacked, 2D or sort of making stacks in 3D of 2D layers. Um, but since the dawn of additive manufacturing or 3D printing as it's also known, there's been, um, a lot more developments in various fields of uh, 3D metamaterials. Um, so I'm just going to go and talk about a few of these very briefly. So two of the fields where 3D metamaterials have probably taken off the most is in um, mechanical and acoustic metamaterials. One of the coolest things going on in mechanical metamaterials is um, making these auxetic materials. So usually if you stretch like a membrane, like in this, in this GIF here, uh, it gets, as it gets longer, it gets thinner. But for auxetics, if you pull something and you stretch it, as it gets longer, it's gonna, it will get fatter. So it has, we call a negative Poisson's ratio. And people have 3D printed, um, like completely 3D structures that will have these properties. And there's a lot more going on mechanic, mechanical stuff beyond that, but this is just a very good example of one of the sort of highlights. In acoustics as well, um, people have 3D printed stuff like this example in the bottom. Um, where they're printing a selective, selectively reflecting uh, acoustic surface um, out of sort of 3D matter atoms. In sort of electromagnetism and 
specifically microarrays, which is going to be the focus of this talk. There's kind of two approaches using for making 3D metamaterials. The first is just to make um, graded refractive index structures. So this is where you basically change the refractive index across a structure and it will cause bending of um, electromagnetic radiation passing through it. Um, and they call these like graded index structures or green structures. And you can use these to make lenses. There's in this example here, published in um, advanced optical materials a little while ago. And you can do cloaking with that as well and various other things. So that's pretty cool. Um, but really a lot of the most exciting metamaterial stuff or most fundamental metamaterial stuff as well for electromagnetism is based around um, metallic structures or at least partially metallic structures. So this is one of the, the foundational papers for um, metamaterials talking about wire grids. So you can basically make a, a wire grid and give it the properties that a metal would expect, like you'd expect to have in a metal, um, but you can completely change like the plasma frequency of this property. So you can basically change when a metal stops behaving like a metal. Um, usually that's for natural metals, that tends to be somewhere in the uh, high visible or the ultraviolet. But here we can bring that kind of plasma frequency, that transition between metallic and non-metallic non behavior all the way down to the microwave. Um, and that's just using kind of a 3D array of wire material, of, of wire wires, a 3D grid of wires. Um, but even that is actually quite difficult to make in 3D, as I'll talk about in a second. Um, and this gives, sorry, this gives negative permittivity is another important thing to note here around your um, region of interest. And then we can do a kind of a converse thing to get negative permeability by um, creating kind of current loops that give you magnetic behaviors. Um, and usually people traditionally do this using split rings. And you can imagine making a 3D um, metamaterial with split rings that have negative permeability. And then trying to make these is, is been difficult. And there's actually not been, not been huge amounts of work on this, especially in the microwave. Some of the foundational papers to show this, um, you know, 10, 20 years ago, were printing all these things on um, 2D circuit boards and putting them together. So this bottom one, they've combined wires and um i should get my uh pointer up actually yeah they combine wires and split rings to give you negative permeability and permittivity and create these negative index materials that's a classic metamaterials experiment and um this paper is by hadlicker and they created this uh negative permittivity kind of dilute metal and again by gluing circuit boards together and so people have done some kind of stack structures in uh, for the optical as well, but really it's it's layers of 2D is what everyone's done to make, make these materials. Um, and so the theory is, you know, getting really, really advanced. There's lots of amazing things we can do, but in the 3D zone for fabricating metallic metamaterials, it's, it's lagging quite a bit. Um, so why is it so difficult? Well, one thing is they're very intricate, like to have a metamaterial working for a wave media, you have to have your unit cell much, much, much smaller than the wavelength of interest. So you have to be able to structure things on a large scale and on a tiny scale at the same time, which is um, sometimes challenging. And also often with the split rings, you need to have inclusions of metal that um, do not touch. So they are kind of floating in a dielectric medium and are not touching other bits of metal. And that is, this remains a fiendishly difficult problem to fabricate, especially on a, any kind of large scale. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can make these materials using additive manufacturing and 3D printing and sort of some of the advantages and some of the limits and challenges to this as well. And then I'm going to get on to how we've utilized this in my own work. So there's a lot of ways to make metallic structures via 3D printing. Um, most of the ones that work well kind of require a continuous metal structure. So for some things like your grids, um, your, your dilute metal grids that I discussed a few slides ago, this works absolutely fine. Uh, so the classic um, strategy is here using powder bed sintering. This is called direct metal laser, laser sintering or D D DMLS um, when it's metals or SLS when it's polymers. And you just have a bed of powder um, 
two beds of powder that are heated up to just below the melting temperature. You scan over with a laser and it kind of melts the 2D cross section of whatever you're trying to print. Then you drop this layer down, put some more powder on and kind of repeat to build your structure. And that works pretty well. Um, these things are quite big and expensive because you have to have very tightly controlled environments because the powder gets a bit explosive otherwise. Uh, but you can make really cool structures from them. But one of the things all of these metallic methods su suffer from is kind of this overhang problem. So if you have um, something coming across at too steep an angle, at too long a distance, you kind of it kind of starts to not be supported by the powder beneath it, and you start to get crumbling um, and cracking in the in the layer, and it can wreck your prints. So actually, in terms of structural stuff, this is the real problem. In terms of making metal materials, it's kind of easier to print things in plastic and then metalize them to avoid this because you can there's plastic printing techniques which can uh, be more robust for this overhang problem um in terms of embedding structures this is still something that's really really difficult and i would say that there's a lot of people working on different methods for this but um a satisfactory as far as i'm aware a satisfactory way to make metal inclusions is um still remains to be achieved and it's really difficult for a number of reasons like you have um to have surface bonding between uh your different layers so this is actually quite hard to achieve between a lot of different um metals and different materials they also have radically different melting points so you, you can't like have a a structure where you could have a metal and a polymer powder being centered with a laser at the same time because there's about a uh, factor of five difference in their melting temperatures. Um, another way to do it is to try and inject inks, which is what um, Zhang et al. had done in Loughborough a few years ago. Um, and even that's difficult because you have to evaporate your solvent to get good conductivity and reduce your loss in the metals. And then you have to sinter it if it's a nanoparticle ink. And again, the sintering temperature um, is often quite similar to melting temperatures of plastics. Um, and you have to have a, a kind of structure that will allow your ink to evaporate. Otherwise you'll get very high losses in your metals. So it's, uh, it's tricky. There's a, there's, a, there's a lot to be done. Um, there's a few exciting approaches that have been kind of um, posited in the last few years. This is a paper that doesn't really quite relate to metamaterials, but I just thought it was an amazing 3D printing paper. Um, these guys, uh, made filaments that had different conducting wires and light emitters and um, like uh, semiconductor crystals inside the filament. And so when they printed it, they were able to sort of position LEDs or um, in some other methods, they did light sensors in it. I just thought that was a, a really awesome way to add functionality to, to 3D prints. And you, you could do stuff with metamaterials that way if you were very clever about where you put um, some metal inclusions in your filament, but again, you'd run into the same problems of having to sinter it without the whole plastic melting. Um, so it's not it's not trivial. Um, but we can do a lot with direct metal printing. There are ways to overcome this overhang problem. If you design instead of having kind of right angle intersections, you design curves. You're able to go a long way to. Um, not have problems with your overhangs. You can also print things at an angle to an extent. Um, but the other problem with metallic printing is it's incredibly costly. So actually, as I said, it's often easier to make things in polymers and then and then metallize it either by dip coating in a conductive paint or by doing that and then um, electroplating it. Um, there are new techniques being developed all the time. Like you know, there's a lot of work going into uh, kind of inkjet based methods of ink jetting um conductive inks along with polymer inks and then if you do that you can kind of center it like layer by layer as you go along um that has some potential i think there's a lot of money being invested in that route and that that could be promising although yeah it tends to work best for small batch production but that's another worry um and then a group at Oxford who we've done some work with uh, have also come up with a, a different way of doing metal injection, where instead of injecting inks where you have to worry about the solvent escaping, they've found, um, or they've used metals, or one called Fields Metal with a melting temperature around 60 degrees. And so they print, they 3D print their mold and then inject the metallic inclusion 
uh, into the mold at around um, sort of 70 degrees, which is way above the melting temperature of this metal, but it's way below the glass transition sort of melting temperature of the, the polymers where they start to deform. And so they're able to make fairly complex metallic inclusions that way. So that's another route that maybe has some potential. Uh, but for now, it's very difficult. Um, so, you know, it's, a, it's definitely a field for those who are interested in 3D metal materials to keep your eye on what the, um, what the engineers, what the manufacturers are doing, because that's what's really going to open the way to new experimental studies um, in this field. Like I, I've tried to uh, develop contacts in, this, uh, in the industries in this area, so I kind of kept abreast of, of what's going on so I can use it in experiments in the future. Um, so that's a very rapid run through of kind of why we're interested in 3D materials and what people have done experimentally and, have, and maybe ways in which this could be expanded by a future um, 3D printing technologies. I'm going to talk to you about two of my own um, investigations so far. The first is going to be about interlaced meshes for broadband metamaterial behaviors, and uh, the second is going to be about 3D um, micro scatterers. And both of these relate quite closely to um, some really, really good work that's being done at ITMO as well. So I'm really excited to be talking to you guys about both of these. Um, so firstly, in terms of 3D interlaced meshes, the structure that we're talking about, when I say interlaced mesh, I mean, we take, basically take a cubic mesh, like the, um, the dilute metal structure that I showed earlier, and we take two of them and we kind of have positioned them so the um there'll always be one rod coming perpendicular to each face of like an imaginary cube shown here for the purposes of this investigation i've put um each kind of meeting point uh at the very middle of a cube made by the other mesh um, I know there's lots of interesting work of people offsetting these, but for, for mine, they're symmetric meshes, um, identical meshes, and they are um, in each, you, each cell of one is in the middle of the, the cell of the other. And these are of interest um, because basically they have very unusual modes they create within them. For a single mesh, as I said, it acts as a dilute metal, and so it kind of has a transverse mode. Um, it actually has a longitudinal mode as well, but it, ha it has a stop band where beneath this, it kind of stops acting like a dilute metal and you can't really get any um, transmission through it. And then you have a band where you have a, a longitudinal and a, a transverse mode. So if you were to shine radiation just through a, a block of this structure, you would get a transverse mode going through it, which is exactly, well, it's not exactly the same, but it's the same kind of mode that you see in free space. Um, and so you, you have no problem kind of shining some kind of, um, or passing some beam through this material and then measuring at the other side. So you might think that if you take a second mesh and put it in the middle, you kind of get more of the same, just with um, properties changing due to the increased density of metal. But actually, you get something completely different. Um, at low frequencies, you see this, this uh, longitudinal mode. It's, it's basically non-dispersive from about, well, we've made grids by about centimeter by centimeter and from about 10 gigahertz down to nothing, it's essentially non-dispersive, which is extremely um, rare for metamaterials, which tend to kind of work around the resonances of their meta atoms. So they tend to really have the properties you want, uh, you know, very um, narrow range of frequencies. But these materials are incredibly broadband, which is exciting. Um, and the mode they create is actually longitudinal. So the, um, the polarization is in the same direction as like the wave vector, the same direction as the direction of travel going through the material, which is also really interesting. Um, the problem with that is it's quite difficult to actually excite because you can't directly couple um, a transverse wave in, three spa in free space to a longitudinal wave inside this material. Um, but there are ways to get around that, which I'll discuss in a couple of slides. So we tried um, making some of these meshes. First of all, we just started to make a single mesh because um, no one had really actually investigated these, a 3D printed single mesh in terms of um, 
microwave transmission. So we thought that'd be a nice experiment to start with. Um, tried a few different ways of 3D printing this. Firstly, we used um, just sort of classic 3D printing of um, fused, dep fused deposition modeling, which is just where you have the filament extrusion. Um, that worked, but it's pretty gross, to be honest. You can visibly see that the cells are not very even. There's a lot of surface roughness. And um, that just results in a lot of loss when you try and measure the transmission through it. So that worked, but wasn't great. And we didn't fancy trying that with a double mesh. So we then tried um, looking at SLS, which is this powder sintering method, but this time we used polymers and then we dip coated it and conducted paint afterwards. Um, we did try electroplating, but it, it's kind of difficult with these mesh structures because you do get quite a lot of shielding. So your electroplating is not always as easy to coat in the center as the outside, um, which is a subject for future experimental investigation. Uh, but this is a much better result. We can see uh, about double the transmission and we kind of can see the whole sort of transmission window, um, which is what we'd predict for these uh, for these structures. So that's good. So the experiment we're doing basically to get these results is we've simulated it on console um, and we are just having a horn antenna either side and shining radiation through the sample. And we kind of put the sample near the receive horn antenna so it's big enough to cover the whole area and you don't get any sort of um, waves traveling around the surface that affect the results. Um, and we can see the envelope, which we expect due to the um, dispersion relation of this. And we also see these Frappy Perro peaks, which are due to reflections from the front and back surface um, interfering and causing these standing waves in the sample. And these are actually quite useful because um, we can use the Frappy Perro resonances to determine the effective index of the material um, for different wave vectors. And we can use, then use that to get a, the dispersion relation for the transverse mode um, along the axis that we're looking, on, looking along through it. So we just looked like along one of the rods, kind of a, along one of the principal axes of this material. And we're able to experimentally determine uh, the dispersion relation kind of to the resolution that we have these Fabi Perro resonances. So that was quite nice. Um, then we wanted to do that with the double mesh, but as I mentioned, the problem with this is that it's a longitudinal mode, so it's difficult to couple to that. Um, you need to have some kind of matching layer to move from a free space transverse mode to this longitudinal mode in the structure. And so, so, so the solution we came up with was to have a layer of antennas um, on our structure. Actually, it, it turns out, um, which uh, Pavel pointed out to us, that someone had posited this idea in 2010, um, this uh, Xin Shen and Fan, and they had, they, their idea was to have an antenna on each mesh um, that were kind of loosely, semi-independent of each other, but still kind of talk to each other. Um, but we went for a kind of a simpler approach. I think this would be slightly difficult to, uh, to 3D print, although you can maybe make it Fire circuit boards, but it was more straightforward to go for a dipole approach. That's what we did. So we've got these sort of monopoles arriving from the end of one of the connecting rods coming out of one of the meshes. Um, and we can see that if we model the transmission through this for like, a, this is modeling for a 10 layer structure um, for perfect conducting materials. So there's no loss, there's no surface roughness. Um, <clears throat> we can see that the kind of thickness, the forward half maximum of each of these um, Fabi Perro peaks kind of corresponds to the envelope of the uh, antenna resonance. So what this tells us is that actually the, um, this is such a wide band um, response in this metamaterial that actually what's limiting <clears throat> the bandwidth we can observe here is gonna be the resonances of these antennas. Because far away from resonances, it's not going to call, it's not going to allow much very good mode matching and we get these um, extremely sharp Fabi pair resonances and if you have any loss these basically just vanish and you can't see into material far away from the antenna resonance but we can see quite a lot doing that 
and we had these fabricated um, again using SLS by some um, collaborators at Loughborough University who do a lot of great 3D printing. Um, <clears throat> we dip coated this in some conductive copper paint and observe the transmission again. And we can see the simulation experiment when you take into account the surface roughness and the, um, the conductivity of the paint actually match up really well. And we're able to use these Fabi Pyro resonances again to uh, obtain an experimental um, evaluation of a limited section of the, uh, the band structure. And again, we get really good agreement with the um, between experiment and theory. There's a slight offset here, which is due to the fact that there's um, this band structure is calculated in like an infinite, um, simulating infinite uh, material in three dimensions. And we actually do have a, a small but finite thickness um, from this matching layer where the antennas are, which offsets everything very slightly. So, um, so yeah, so this is, oh, I should highlight, this is the first experimental kind of investigation into this structure. Um, and it's hopefully gonna open the door to looking at all kinds of new um, interlaced meshes and uh, the very interesting physics that's being developed um, by ourselves and by the group at the Power Bell of ITMO and various other groups across the, the world as well. So I'm gonna just round off my section on interlaced meshes by um, just talking about another thing you can do with these structures. Um, as we're coupling into this from a plane wave, which has a given polarization and given, given K vector, um, we're using this uh, matching layer of our antennas to uh, connect this to the longitudinal wave, longitudinal mode that exists inside the structure. And actually, because we're doing that, um, the instant polarization, once it's once it's kind of coupled in, has has no impact on the on the interior mode. So it kind of becomes a, a black box and you can choose the um, radiation on the far sides to appear in any way you can design a matching layer for. So you can design <clears throat> any kind of antenna at any angle of polarization or, um, I mean, if you were clever, you might be able to do something like circular polarization or design a, a phase a gradient on the far face. And you can do lots of interesting things to the polarization and, um, the phase that's coming through the structure. And we also demonstrated this in our paper last year. So just to conclude this um, section on interlaced meshes, this was the first experimental study of these materials. Um, they're really interesting material. I think there's a lot of um, exciting work to be done on them. And this SLS printing and the metallization by dip coating gives, gives workable samples. Um, and I think, you I know, mean, for a proof of concept, I'm pretty happy about the results we got from them. But there was, you know, a reasonable amount of loss due to surface roughness and the non-perfect conductivity of the copper paint. Um, so I think looking for ways to improve this would be a focus for experimental work going down the line. Sorry, Alex, uh, for the interruption. There is a question in the chat. Um, yeah. What happens? If there is antenna size mismatch on the two sides of the materials block? Ah, yeah, that's a cool question. Um, yeah, yeah, do feel free to, uh, we can have questions as we go through, that's absolutely fine. So, can I go back? What's going on? Yeah, um, basically, I think it would reduce the amount of radiation you uh, would get out of the far face. So you, you'd, have, you'd have a different envelope of um, where you get good kind of coupling between the longitudinal mode inside the structure and the uh, transverse mode outside the structure. And so you'd only kind of get, if, if the back face was different to the front face in that respect, then um, you would kind of reduce the level of frequencies that you could couple well out of the back face and I guess you get increased reflection um, at other frequencies from the front face. So your kind of your your range of frequencies you couple out well would be these sort of if, if this red curve and this blue curve was your front and back um, antennas, kind of the the crossover between the two would be where you'd get um, good outcoupling from the far face. And I guess over in this section would be where you get um, 
more reflection from the, the incident phase. Thank you. And we have one raised hand from uh, Dr. Maxim Goroch. Maxim. Yes, thank you, Alex. So I have a question regarding the fabrication of this interpenetrable wire mesh. So do you fabricate some parts uh, of this structure and then assemble it by hands or you print the entire structure? So could you comment please on the details? Yeah, you, where's the picture of the structure? We print the entire structure as a block. Um, wait, I actually have it in my office, so I'll show you. So yeah, the, the important thing, so it's printed as a, as a whole block. And you can see at the bottom, it's got this, um, this like base layer. And then we only, dip, we only dip it up to like here in the in the conductive paint. So um, if you if, if you get any kind of connection between the two meshes, the whole thing is, is destroyed. So you have to be really careful that that, that doesn't happen. So um, that's and that's another advantage of actually printing it in polymers and then metallizing it, because we can just dip it up to this line, and then this, this plate at the bottom where the two meshes physically connect is not electrically connected. If you were to print the whole thing in metal, you'd have to find a way to um, to, to work around that. But yeah, it's, it's printed as a whole block. And that's that's kind of something I'm trying to do as much as I can in, um, in 3D metal materials is to print things as, as one structure. Right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, great. So if there's no other questions on this section, I will keep going. Um, but feel free to we'll have more questions at the end. Um, so if people want to have things they think they want to ask about further down the line, then that's totally grand. So the next section is about um, 3D uh, microwave scatterers. And really, um, I'm calling them 3D spoof plasma microwave scatterers. Um, I understand that spoof path models can be a, um, a controversial term, but I think they're a good way to explain the, um, could be to describe the effects that we're seeing. So for those of you that have not encountered this term before, um, basically at, in um, optical metals, you can have a wave that travels along the surface of a metal called a spoof plasmon that is bound between the surface of the metal and some dielectric nearby, and it decays um, evanescently into each layer. So it decays, it decays quite quickly into the dielectric above and the metal below as it travels along the surface. Um, at kind of radio frequencies and micro frequencies, electromagnetic waves are not typically um, strongly localized to the metal surface because the metals become effectively um, perfect conductors at these frequencies. And so you have essentially no field inside the metal, perfect screening at the surface. And then you have a very, very weakly bound field um, kind of extending into space above it. So the behaviors are quite different. Um, so again, sort of more towards the dawn of experimental um, metal materials, you had quite a lot of work, some of it at Exeter actually, um, going towards, uh, trying to recreate these plasmonic surface waves in the microwave. And people found, starting by Pendry, but also taken on by um, people in Exeter, Alistair Hibbins or samples. Um, if you pattern a metal surface, then you can have, um, there's various ways of getting this field penetration into the surface that allows you to have these kind of bound waves traveling across the surface of this structure. Um, and people have referred to this as spoof plasmons or designer plasmons. And there's various different geometries you can get to uh, achieve this kind of effect. <coughs> so a bit later than that, um, people try to make localized plasmons, um, which is plasmons that aren't free to, uh, to travel just across the surface. They're kind of bound to um, a specific perimeter. And they did this just by taking like a, a row of grooves and ridges and uh, bending it around into a circle, either a sort of a 2D flat shape or a extended cylinder shape. People have done experiments in both. And they found that um, this corrugated structure was actually able to 
uh, act as an effective medium with an effective um, permittivity and the uh, scattering cross section you got between this um, corrugated material and this effective material that you could model based on the properties of it uh, are um, pretty comparable, especially at the low mode orders. Um, not perfectly comparable. <clears throat> and um, there's recently been interest in making sort of more 3D samples of these as well. But this is not fully 3D. This is uh, kind of 2D or extended 2D. So the question I'm asking in this section is, what about uh, 3D spoof plasmons? Um, what can we do with them? And <clears throat> there has been a few efforts to kind of create these properties, but um, most of these only really work in the, the dipolar regime. And only, even then, for many of them, only at specific angles and polarizations. So um, there's been some studies trying to make these two are essentially just crossed dipoles at right angles with um, caps on the end that give them um, a shortening and a shortening of the um, a lowering of the frequency, sorry, and an, an increase in the scattering power, so you can see them more easily. Um, these wire structures <clears throat> try and create the surface impedance that would um, be present in a, a dipolar resonator. And it's <clears throat> It's not really convincing that any of these can argue that they're actually replicating plasmonic properties in the um, in the microwave. And this is all the approaches in this field that I'm aware of so far. Um, one of the more interesting approaches was done by Pavel Ginsberg's group. And they uh, actually made an artificial magnon structure, um, which is instead of having a negative permittivity, they had a negative permeability, which they made by just making a bunch of split rings on circuit boards and stacking them in a sort of spherical structure. And they're able to get like a magnetic resonance that they can measure from this. And that was really cool. But again, um, <clears throat> it's mostly a fundamental mode and it mostly, it will, it will only work for a very sort of set range of um, angles, instant angles and polarizations. So uh, the claim that I make here is that it's, there's not really a convincing demonstration of um, 3D spoof plasmonic, spoof plasmonic particles in the microwave. So my solution to answer this is to look to high order symmetries of 3D shapes, um, by which I mean the platonic solids. So we've seen that there were structures based around cubes so far, um, which is this and this. Um, and we're going right to the edge, the most high symmetry structures to look at the icosahedron. So if we make a structure, it's a sphere where we have um, trenches at every edge of an icosahedra going towards a metallic core at the center. Um, this would hopefully be able to give us uh, more of a surface wave response of a spherical structure. And so the way we look at this is to firstly look at the scattering pattern of the sphere. We can see we have several modes and so we can sort of do our counting of more mode orders of dipole, quadrupole, and then octopole further up here. And we can, although the octopole doesn't quite match up here, but we can see that we have a dipolar field for dipole, a quadrupolar field for the second mold, mode, and a sort of octopole field for the, the third order mode. So, so far, so good. Um, the way we compare if, if this matches to an effective medium approximation <coughs> is to kind of unwrap the whole structure into a net and then look along. Okay, Kind of just looked along the x-axis um, to begin with because it's it's the most reliably it, 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 looking, looking along here replicates what we see in in um, this sphere probably most reliably. Um, and then we can look at the dispersion relation, and from the asymptotic frequency, we can um, determine the plasma frequency um, or the effective plasma frequency of this structure. Um, and then from that, we can determine an effective uh, permittivity for this. <clears throat> and if we model just a sphere um, of this effective permittivity, we can see that actually it matches, matches pretty good for the first couple modes. Um, and then as we get to higher orders, it, it starts to be uh, a much poorer match, which kind of looking at the structure makes sense because you can see how it could easily support dipoles, can easily can quite well support quadrupoles, but then having like an octopole with six points around an edge um, 
is going to you're, you're going to have um, your structure becomes quite large on that when looking at that scale. So it kind of makes sense. This third mode is not so not so reliable, but for the first two modes, we can say this is pretty convincingly, I think, a surface structure, a surface wave um, behavior. And so <clears throat> I've 3D printed some of these. Again, this is done by photopolymerization um, and then dip coating and then electroplating. And we placed them in our anechoic chamber and measured the RCS both um, in the reverse direction and in the forward direction. And the samples will be placed where this drone currently is in this picture. And we get pretty good um, uh, agreement between theory and experiment here. So the question next is, can we do, can we do better? Because um, as I said before, the original papers claiming to have uh, replicated spoof plasmonic behaviors in 3D particles only really show dipoles. I've only really taken that one stage further with the, um, the icosahedra um, and shown reliable quadrupoles. Can we go beyond that and show like a, a larger range of higher order modes? And the approach I've taken for that is to further divide up this icosahedra to get a geodesic sphere. And we just do this by taking um, equilateral triangles in each um, kind of existing triangle of the icosahedron and stretching the vertices so they meet the surface of the sphere surrounding it. And that allows us to have almost identical triangles at um, each of the, uh, how many faces is it? 20 times four, like 80 faces we have now. So we have much higher, <coughs> um, much more detailed structures here. And if we repeat the, uh, the same simulations that we've done before, um, look at the wave vector going along this unfolded structure and use that to obtain um, an effective permittivity, um, we get very good agreement for the first three modes. And then when we get, to, I get it's not, not until we get to the fourth mode now that uh, we start to see uh, less of an agreement between the structures. And we're currently having this fabricated by our colleagues at Lepra. Um, you know, you could keep chasing this by having increasing subdivisions, but at some point you get diminishing returns in both in novelty and in difficulty fabricating it. Um, but <clears throat> this is a pretty convincing demonstration of um, replicating surface waves in localized surface plasmons for the microwave, or localized surface plasmon like behavior for the microwave. And the effective permittivities we see here are for this structure around about um, minus 10, which relates very nicely to um, kind of what we see in metals, which support plasmons in the optical. So for silver in the optical, the effective permittivity is like between minus five, about minus five and about minus 25. Um, so we're right in that in that range where we'd expect to see um, spruce surface plasmons here. Excuse me, Alex, we have a raised hand from the Dr. Martin Gorolich. So Alex, yeah, uh, another That's short it. question uh, yeah, regarding uh, this epsilon effective. So how do you determine it? Uh, do you obtain it by fitting this scattering spectra or you calculate it somehow theoretically? Oh, sorry, yeah, I, I um, meant to go into more detail about that. So I've, I've unwrapped, I've unwrapped this structure into like a 2D, a 2D plane. Mm -hmm. um, and this is like the net of the structure. I've kind of, this is, and I've kind of taken the, the whole thing and taken it to 2D. So the depth is equivalent to the radius between the edge of the sphere and the central metal core. And um, then, the um, distance in X is, is kind of equivalent to the, uh, at the top is equivalent to the distance taken across the top here. And because we have the same angle going down right through, we kind of converted angle into um, X position. And then I measure the surface waves. I measure the dispersion of surface waves traveling across this material that I've created in 2D. Um, and I achieve, a um, asymptotic frequency um, here, which gives us the plasma frequency, effective plasma frequency of this. And then we can plug that into the Druder equation and get an effective uh, medium approximation. Yeah, yeah, but I think it's a bit unfair comparison because uh, if we're speaking about the pictures on the right, then 
you have to replace this sphere by, by something with the epsilon which depends on the distance to the center, so epsilon on R, because you see you have radially inhomogeneous structure, at least looks like from, from the picture. So could you comment on that? Yeah. Um, so first, I'm trying to think of the best way to answer this. It's a very, it's a very good question. Really, the most important parameter is the depth of these um, gaps. First of all, it's the first thing to say, and. Um, If you have a way of traveling around the outside of something, I think it's really the, in terms of a like a circular or spherical structure, it's really more the the angle that each thing subtends is more important than the um, the x y coordinates. So I'm kind of trying to take take transform angle into into x and y here. I'm. Yeah, it's all the explanation. I'm pretty sure that um, I'm pretty sure that this holds true, but I don't feel I've answered your question satisfactorily just yet. <laughs> I might have to get back to you on that. Yeah. Okay. So it, since it's not published, uh, I believe it's good to to give some ideas. So why not? No, no. It, I mean, this is. Um, I, I know you guys are really like uh, um, do a lot of work and stuff like this. So I'm, this is the sort of feedback I'm hoping to to get to strengthen this <laughs> strengthen yes. this work. I see Pavel has some question probably. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to add actually, Alex, um, maybe you are dealing not with sphere of epsilon. Maybe this is sphere uh, which is covered by some impedance. What you are doing when you uh, study spoof plasmons on the interface of this uh, spoof plasmon and the free space, you actually uh, kind of identifying dependence of impedance of this surface as function of the frequency. And then maybe a bit uh, kind of easier answer to Maxim question could be, say, if you model a sphere uh, covered uh, by this impedance, maybe it will uh, better correspond to your simulations. Because indeed, uh, by an eye, you see that it's definitely not isotropic sphere. Yes. So probably what is isotropic here, it's a surface of the sphere. And maybe it's not really isotropic sphere out of some metamaterial, but some impedance sphere. Mm. As, as a comment, yeah, because it's still- No, no, that's interesting. Yeah? And maybe, maybe numerically you also can quite easily do it. Some impenetrable sphere and some impedance on top and impedance here will be kind of nice. So you will also get some results. Maybe even correspondence will be better in a sense between uh, your kind of uh, numerical simulation of particular structure and effective uh, medium, whatever, effective impedance structure. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a really interesting idea. I'll definitely look into that. Thanks, Pavel. Um, Okay, so I think we've basically come to the end here. Um, so, so just to summarize, I've talked about how additive manufacturing can open new doors to design and uh, experimentation of experimental demonstration of novel 3D materials. Um, and really 3D printing technology is gonna inf in, in, inform and improve what we can achieve experimentally in this field. So I think it's worth keeping track of kind of developments in um, what's going on in the 3D printing world, and also, you know, additive manufacturing beyond that. 3D printing is the end of the end of everything. Um, I've shown about interlaced wire grids and uh, how they have very um, interesting dispersion effects, and how we can use 3D printed models to um, to measure them. I've also talked about 3D spoof pass one particles as a sample of some recent developments in this field in Exeter. Um, and I hope you've enjoyed the talk. And if anyone else has any more questions then I'd be really happy to answer them because the questions so far have been great. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. We have two raised hands. 
so dear colleagues, if you have any questions, please raise your hands or uh, write something in the chat. So the first can was from the Dr. Stanislav Golbowski, please. Okay, uh, uh, Alex, thank you so much for this interesting talk. Um, I have a question uh, regarding the experimental setup and the method you used to, uh, to obtain the dispersion uh, characteristics of different metamaterial samples you've manufactured. Uh, in, in particular, you, you said that you first measured uh, the spectral positions of fabric repair resonances, and then uh, you can actually predict uh, the dispersion relation for the corresponding uh, infinite uh, structure. And so you can compare these experimental discrete points with the simulational uh, uniform curve, right? Yeah. And, um, but I, I, I may assume that uh, the wave which is traveling inside the sample may experience some phase shifts uh, when reflected from the boundary of the sample. Or maybe some, uh, some radiation can, can arise when, when it is reflected. Or some or this partial radiation. So how does it affect this method? So how accurate is this method from your experience? Could you give some advice, please? That's a really good question. Um, it's something that we we have had discussions about, and as a topic of further research. But because we had such a good match between our kind of theoretical predictions and our our experiment, it didn't didn't seem to be a huge issue in this case. So I, I can't really comment on that um, beyond what I've shown, but I think it'd be something that would be really interesting to um, to explore further. Mm -hmm. yeah, because uh, I saw you, you had very good correspondence in some of the curves you, you have shown. Mm. And so, so it's really nice. So, so it looks like it works very well, but yeah. So, so, so it's good maybe to apply this method for many different structures and, and, and compare somehow Will, will it be uh, so accurate in all the cases or not? So, so at least. Yeah, no, that would curious. be that would be a, a a great thing to look into, look into more. It's yeah, it's something that you know was a bit beyond the scope of this work because you know one of those things where it's it's, it's worked well, so we didn't really uh, decide not to poke it any further. <laughs> but um, no, it's a, it's a fantastic question. Okay, thank you so much. The next question from Maxim Gorolich. So, Alex, first of all, thank you for the very nice talk. It's, it's really a pleasure to see such high quality structures like those interpenetrating wire meshes. So it, it really uh, may be at the forefront of modern capabilities. So I have uh, mostly the educational question uh, to educate myself. So uh, could you summarize uh, maybe the main challenges in fabricating high index uh, three-dimensional 3D printed structures? So what are the main uh, problems there. Just just high, high index structures, you say? Yeah, let's say some ceramics, uh, something with very large yeah. primitivity. So that's, that is a field which is that sort of grade index, high index structures is, is definitely ahead of the, the sort of metallic inclusions in electromagnetism. There's people like some of my um, colleagues in Loughborough um, who've, and, and beyond that have done quite a lot of work in that kind of field. Um, and in some ways, we're almost there, really. Like, there's a company called Premix who does very high permittivity filaments. Um, they're based in Finland. They do, well, they do they do block polymers, which is like an ABS and ceramic powder inclusions. Um, and they also do filaments for 3D printing. And the guys at Loughborough um, have a lot of experience in working with their materials and can print them really nicely. You can get permittivities up to about 15 um, with these structures. And they very they're very low loss as well. So I think I think they're really fantastic materials to work with. Um, the only problem with them in terms of three D printing is especially it's more of a problem for the higher permittivity ones than the lower permittivity ones. Is they're not um, quite isotropic because the way they're filaments, so you print them like in a layer by layer filament structure, and um, you kind of any air gaps you have, and there's always some. Are going to lie kind of along one plane along a certain axis um, and that means that you actually end up with a slightly different permittivity depending on which way your electric field is polarized going through it and so for a lot of stuff 
you, that doesn't matter. You don't care. Like a, a lot of the work at Loughborough has been involved in making um, like metamaterial material graded index lenses. And so your radiation is always coming through at one in one direction. So it doesn't really matter if it's anisotropic in a different plane. But for other stuff, it could be it could be um, difficult. But um, but the, the materials are really are fantastic for high index stuff. I haven't really touched on that here because that's was not slightly to the side of the focus of this talk. But um, they can uh, they can do that kind of thing really well. Yeah, thanks. So uh, do I understand correctly that uh, epsilon up to fifteen is feasible technological, and people are doing that? Uh, like no yeah, problem. fifteen is fifteen is quite new. I think the um, obviously for higher um, permittivities, you're going to have higher loading of these um, ceramic powders, and so the materials come more, become more brittle and harder to work with. So it's kind of a constant trade-off in trying to push that. Um, but when I started at Exeter two years ago, it was it was twelve was the limit. So they've already pushed it to fifteen, so they are mm -hmm. you know, expanding. And then, and then a quick follow-up question: So what about embedding some non-reciprocal elements? Let's say something having uh, magnetization. We are doing some kind of project. So, something, something what? Sorry. Uh, something non-reciprocal, some magnetized stuff with, with magnetization. Yeah. You some mean geotropic. 3D printing magnetic. Yeah. So can, can you can you embed somehow these non-reciprocal uh, elements at least in some places, or it's it's out of the uh, capabilities? What do you mean? What do you mean by embed? Well, uh, so you print the structure and you have some some parts of it uh, with have, which have constant magnetization. Let's say. Right. But you're wanting you're wanting to to have magnetization in the print. You're not trying to like physically put something in later. Yeah, I guess it, it could be hard. So can, can we print that somehow? It's, Just to educate a, ourselves. It's hard. Um, people have people have tried to do that. Um, we messed around with that a little bit uh, in my previous position at ICFO when I, we were trying to play with um, 3D printing powder structures. But the loading, the loading for um, magnetic particles needs to be really, really high to have any kind of power in it. Um, and it's it's difficult. I haven't I haven't really been following that side of the field in the last couple of years. Um, it hadn't really been done super convincingly about three in, from about three years ago when I was last paying attention to sort of the magnetism side of things. And it, it seems to be quite a difficult challenge. Um, there may have been a breakthrough since then, but as far as I'm aware, it's it's very difficult. Okay, thank you, Alex. Very nice talk, and this is very helpful. Thanks. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Max, I, I, I have another thing to, to answer uh, in addition to Alex, to you actually in Kaliningrad, there is a large grant about 3D printing and they know how to print permanently magnetized uh, composites. Yeah, so oh, do they? Them. Yeah, yeah. Do you know how, st how strong they are? It's last, it's last, last, huh? Do you know how strong they are? How strong the, the magnets are? Uh, I, I, I don't remember. They kind of, the, the, the goal of the huge grant is to finally print large magnets really large, mm. they're quite large, like a 0.5 Tesla inside. Oh, wow. They're okay. printing it by, by parts. Yeah, it's worth, worth checking what they're doing. Okay, uh, yeah, no, young I... Lady, young lady is leading the project. Yeah, we kind of know her. So it may be useful also to, to share some experience with her. She recently moved from Moscow State University to East Kaliningrad about two years ago. Okay, and uh, Max, you stole uh, one of the questions of mine to Alex about high epsilon, but I still have the second one. Uh, Alex, uh, can you, it's, it's a bit more kind of detailed. You cover by some paint these nice uh, 3D printed uh, structures. How good is this uh, metal there? Have you somehow measured conductivity uh, or some other properties? What is it? Yes. Yeah? So, you have very good agreement between simulations and experiment, probably because the frequencies are quite high and the thickness of the metal is definitely larger than the skin depth, but still some issues with conductivity uh, and roughness should be there. Can mm -hmm. you estimate it? Is it really metal or it's something else with much worse conductivity? Well, it's the conductivity, I think, off the top of my head, is, so it's, it's, it's copper flakes and paint. 
um, or copper-coated silver flakes in in some kind of um, it's actually a water-based solvent, surprisingly, with a copper thing, mm -hmm. um, and its conductivity was stated by the manufacturers to be something like ten to the five, um, and we found that matched pretty well with our simulations, and so we didn't. Um, when we simulated ten to the five, it matched pretty well with the experimental results that we got, and so we didn't push it further by doing like the sort of four-point probe tests or anything like that, which I think you would want to do for more rigorous study. Yeah, I think it's okay. It's okay for proof of concept stuff. Um, it's bridging a gap to making useful materials. Like it's not, it's not really there. Um, one thing I would, I would like to do going forward is to try and convince someone to um, print this in, in metal. Um, but it might it might need a bit of a redesign of the structure to to do that effectively because um i haven't had very many positive conversations with metal 3d printing people about it about these kind of structures in the past but um i think really that's where the that's where the future of it has to lie if it's going to be like something that we're going to use but but still, you have to, it doesn't get it doesn't get you around the surface roughness because the best way to three D print this with metal is going to be still going to be powder sintering. So you're still going to have the surface roughness, and it will remain to be seen if that's the limiting factor or not. I think. Okay. I see. I see. Thank you. Thank you, dear colleagues. Do you have any other questions to Alex? So maybe I have just one, pretty practical. So is it possible to? Uh, 3D print uh, alumina and zirconia. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are. Do you, you mean an alumina zirconia alloy? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, so ceramics, right? Yeah, oh, right, ceramics yeah. Um, and, uh, so, probably is the answer. <laughs> Basically, the state, as, as I'm aware of it, the state of um, 3D printing high permittivity stuff is that this company, Premix, are really the only company doing really high permittivity stuff that's commercially available. Please. There are a lot. There are a lot of groups building materials to be 3D printed um, with other high permittivity ceramic high permittivity ceramics. I think Premix don't quite disclose their exact mix. Premix. I, I think I think they don't quite disclose their exact mix of what they've got in their ceramics. Um, maybe if you ask them, they tell you. But there's 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 lots of groups working on um, 3D printing other high permittivity ceramic structures. But it's um, it's not a trivial thing to be to be doing at all. Um, and the high, you know, again, the higher the higher loading fraction you have and the higher permittivities you're trying to achieve, the more difficult it becomes to actually print anything beyond just like a sort of extended 2D thing. So the guys at Loughborough have been doing a lot of work on that um, novel materials of 3D printing as well. So it's maybe worth checking out some of their stuff. Um, yeah, I was trying to think of everyone's name. I'll, 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 send, you, I'll send you all their names when you, um, if you give, send me an email because I've forgotten some of them off the top of my head. I don't want to embarrass myself on this. So. <laughs> okay, thank you. So we have one last question from the chat. So from you, uh, our PhD student, Yogeni Kareshun. So I have a question about the double metal mesh. You made antennas on the interfaces, one of which had vertical polarization. The other had horizontal polarization. Thus, you showed the rotation of the polarization when the wave passing the wire materials. And my question is following. What happens if I connect two sets of antennas on interfaces directly with simple wires instead of complicated double wire mesh? Yeah, that's a good question. So you, you're just talking, you just mean like a wire with two antennas, with an antenna on either side with different things. Is that is this what the question is asking? Genial. 
sorry, I okay. have a problem with my microphone. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, my question is following: what, 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 what happened if I connect it directly? If I, if, I, if I use uh, the simple wire uh, between the antenna with a different polarization? Yeah. So, uh, they would... oh, sorry. No, no, I'm sorry. Um, basically, they would interfere with each other, like because there's with with. This structure, the two wires are completely, the two antennas on either side and either face are completely screened from each other. If they're always connected by wires, they'd be able to kind of communicate and crosstalk. So you'd get interference in the far field from like the, um, mm. the uh, radiation from kind of each radiation scattered from each antenna. Um, if you look at things like Van Atta arrays, they kind of work on that principle. But one thing people have done, um, which if, again, if you email me, I'd be happy to send you a link to this paper. Some people a couple of years ago um, kind of took this idea to its logical conclusion. I mean, they, they weren't starting from the double mesh idea. They were just thinking about polarization rotation, but actually it works out as, as a similar thing for that concept. They just had like a row of antennas on one side pointing vertically and they had a metal sheet and this, they had this whole um, sort of 2D mesh of antennas on one side, and then these antennas were connected via wire going through a small hole in the 2D sheet um, to antennas on the other side, and they achieved, and those antennas were horizontal instead of vertical, and they achieved really good polarization that way. And you know, one way to look at this double mesh structure is as, as a um, as a kind of transmission line structure. So you can imagine the antennas connected to the central wire, uh, part of a transmission line. Um, for the purposes of polarization rotation anyway. And that's just what these guys did, but they only used the 2D or sort of three layer um, planar setup to achieve this kind of thing. So that is the way that you'd achieve polarization rotation if you just wanted to use like a single wire without the double mesh is have this kind of screen in the middle with a bunch of holes in it. And if, if you're interested in that paper, I can, I can send that to you later because yeah. it, it was pretty well done. Thanks a lot for explanation. Okay, thank, you. thank you very much, Alex, for the very interesting talk. So I think we're done today. And see you, everybody, next Monday again on our microwave seminar. Goodbye for everyone. All right. Thanks, everyone. It's been a pleasure chatting to you.